absolutely lovely thank you very much for the invitation uh, i'm very happy to be here with you today so what i'm going to do today is i'm going to try to not necessarily convince you but show you a certain uh, philosophy of uh, how we think about studying intelligence and, and cognition and there are different options different opportunities um, for people in various fields to, to do that i'm going to show you just you know how i reason about this and how i argue for a specific approach my intention is not to really go and delve into my own work here today is rather to provide like an overlook outlook and uh, maybe highlight some of the important uh, aspects of, of uh, our philosophy that leads to some pieces of work that i'm going to show at the very end it's just to a uh, cursory look through some of the uh, more uh, sort of findings uh, related to the overall idea of modeling uh, cognition and intelligence okay so let's let's start we can we can think about cognition and thinking as one of those activities or aspects of activities of human that have been really lock, uh, that locked a lot of imagination in the past uh, it's been long lasting fascination really in human thought and we can see it in art and we can see it's reflected in philosophy um, so it's really one of those common threads across the uh, across the years, across generations, how much interest has been from multiple different perspectives in cognition, in thinking, in, in, in human capacity to actually enjoy thought. Uh, so cognition itself, what, what is that? It's, I think, inseparably intertwined with the notion of intelligence. And that's why I, in the title, I, I put intelligence. So cognition comes from Latin cognitio, uh, which is related to um, understanding or getting to know. Uh, it's really what we think about in the broader terms. When we look into the cognitive psychology uh, textbooks, you usually see some sort of definitions. Uh, I would rather th th think, about, think of it as an umbrella term, umbrella term for various mental processes that allow us to maintain, understand, use information, I think important notion is this use manipulate information to create knowledge. And of course, there are loads of different aspects of human high, high level sort of uh, processes, brain process involved, um, perception, learning, memories usually mentioned, planning, reasoning. Of course, we cannot forget about language. And there are plenty more that go under this, um, uh, under this, uh, under this umbrella term of uh, cognition. And intelligence, as I said, intertwined with the notion of cognition, um, it's really capacity for logic, understanding, reasoning, learning, planning. So we, we can see we use similar words here. So basically, under, uh, intelligence is the way is capacity for us to use our cognitive capacity uh, capabilities. Um, sometimes people look at this more, more from a holistic perspective and then think about organizing your thoughts, organizing like holistically information uh, to turn this into a meaningful thought process. So uh, how does neuroscience come into that? Well, if we think about human thought, quite natural is to think about the, uh, about the brain, uh, because this is where the brain, this is where the human thought originates. There's been a lot of ideas on where the human thought and perceptual capabilities of the, uh, our perceptual capabilities originate from. There were early ideas of the heart and different parts of the brain. Uh, Today, we th I think we converge on the understanding that the brain is really the source of our, our thought. And as you can think, on the one hand, we have the human uh, intelligence. On the other hand, here, if you look from a from perspective, of technical perspective, we've been always locked. Our imagination has been always attracted by this uh, idea of, of creating machine intelligence, somehow reproducing this human intelligence. So if we look from the perspective of intelligence as such, from the AI and from the neuroscience perspective, well, some people would say that we're actually effectively stu studying the same thing. It's just we're asking different questions. Uh, so questions come along, of course, with different ways or routes that we go to the, towards this question. So on the one hand, we have, of course, the AI perspective where we're trying to investigate theories or build theories. Uh, we build, develop computer systems and with the hope that they will be able to carry out some of the tasks that require what we call human, sometimes we refer to as a biological intelligence. And as we said before, these are these cognitive capacities I named before, like perception, recognition, decision-making, control. From the neuroscience perspective, the object, as we said, is the same, but the sort of the, the approach we take is more from the, uh, through studying the structure of the brain, 
function of the brain, mechanisms, and neural mechanisms. So what are really the biological um, principles that underlie the, the, this fantastic uh, emergent phenomena of, of intelligence, of human intelligence. So if we think about this, from the, if, if we think about uh, machine intelligence, and we think about how we go uh, towards what we call historically general AI, uh, really the idea here is that we're trying to mimic the human capacity. And we can do it in various different ways. We can think, we can, uh, we can consider this as, as uh, the need to think humanly. So this is where we don't really care about the underlying substrate, but we care about this un uh, function, uh, which is uh, what we call like a thinking human-like. Uh, some, on some level, we can also uh, be happy enough with thinking rationally and how we differentiate or dissociate humanly from rational thinking, human from rational thinking, that obviously uh, involves um, systems like emotional and, and, and other aspects. So uh, these are two different aspects, of course, people have thought of um, when, when they try to conceive the term of uh, intelligent machines. Uh, Thinking is one aspect, the other aspect is acting. Uh, this is something I didn't really maybe emphasize much before, but uh, in a separable aspect of cognition is of course embodiment and the need, need to interact with the environment. So we have certain level of action involved, obviously. So also on this, on this, uh, in this uh, rectangle of uh, how we can think of machine intelligence, we can think about either acting humanly or just acting rationally along similar axes, as we said before. So from the brain perspective now, so if we think about this neuroscience grand vision when it comes to studying intelligence, uh, there's this uh, you know, idea of mapping genes to behavior, to cognition, to intelligent behavior, which obviously is a bit of a challenge. Uh, and that challenge you know, comes along uh, with, with uh, various different factors. I don't, I'm not gonna name all of them, but obviously brain is complex uh, and that's a very trivial thing to say. This complexity is reflected in, in you know, uh, multi-modality, uh, in uh, multi-scales, multi-levels, uh, multiple different levels of organization of the brain, and so on and so on. So this ambition of mapping genes to behavior is, is a daunting task. And sometimes I always get a feeling that uh, historically, be because we, we sort of approached uh, the brain from such an, uh, I would say, grand vision pers perspective, we sometimes think about uh, cognition in a bit defragmented way. Uh, so we're trying to find out you know, the low level correlates of cognition. Um, on the one hand, we're trying to find this you know, more uh, psychological understanding of cognition without really trying to, uh, without really having opportunity to bridge the gaps. Um, I think to some extent, cognitive science is something which helps us um, sort of in reintegrate the notion of uh, intelligence. In, in neuroscience. Uh, and it's not only cognitive science, it's also uh, a more theoretical approach, obviously, where we actually gain a little bit more understanding on the system level, on the mechanism that, that actually lead to what we call cognitional intelligence. So to some extent, on the one hand, we have cognitive science. On the other hand, what we call is, is theoretical brain science, computational modeling, which I'm going to talk a little bit more later on. So, why do we really get fascinated about the brain? I mean, a lot of words have been written and have been said, so I'm not gonna repeat them much to the extent of this discussion. I'm gonna just, you know, remind you basic facts. Uh, obviously brain is plastic. Uh, it has cap capability to adaptively learn, uh, which we all who do study intelligent systems know how important it is. Uh, it's, it has tremendous flexibility, functional flexibility, uh, but not, not, also, not only a functional uh, flexibility, um, has one very important feature, we, which we also seek in intelligent systems, which is multi-purposeness. Uh, so it solves multiple tasks. So the infrastructure that the brain carries with it, itself, with the neural substrate, is really serving multiple purposes. It also has intrinsic capability to deal with, to deal with uncertainty, ambiguity. It deals with fragmentary information, obviously, um, engineers care a lot about the energy consumption, uh, the fact it's massively parallel, so it can, it can perform a lot of operations in, 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 in the same time. But at the same time, it's surprising how serial brain is, as, as we, we, we don't always realize. Um, it's fault tolerant, uh, and engineers also would, would praise brain for robust information processing. What I want to focus on really is this cognitive functionality uh, and, and coordination of behavior. That's, that's really what I want to focus on here. 
So why do we go towards the brain as an inspiration for intelligence and higher order cognition, right? Uh, because we could just, as we said before, we could be happy enough to, to uh, reason with human-like thinking, uh, human-like acting, uh, without necessarily going all the way to the brain itself as an inspiration. Uh, why, why is it worth going into the brain as the neural substrate, as a neural structure, physical structure as the inspiration? Well, I would argue that actually it is the only tangible proof of feasibility of intelligence as we see it. Um, and of course here, the key assumption is that intelligence is the outcome of computation. So we have to make this assumption. And by the way, this assumption lays at the foundation of what we call, uh, what we call computational theory of mind. Uh, which is which is important to underlie all studies of mind consciousness to some extent consciousness, but I would say rather cognition and intelligence. And of course, this notion of computation, we should remember, involves uh, what we also engineer like uh, always think of is inform how we represent information, how we process information. So all this goes under the name of computations in this context. So when we think about uh, computations, we, we should not forget about uh, David Mars. Uh, three-level analysis, or some, sometimes we call it three-level hypothesis. So the, the David Marr was the cognitive scientist who studied vision in particular, and he, his idea was that we should study uh, computational uh, systems, computational neural systems, using this like a three-prong three approach. So on the one hand, we should definitely understand the, uh, we should build a computational theory. So we should conceptualize the problem we wanted to solve. Like for example, in vision, we wanted to see, let's say shapes. That's the kind of computational problems. And of course you can go in a more detail to describe this problem in, in, in a more, let's say, uh, you can pro problematize this, this problem uh, in more detail, uh, more operationally. Uh, and then the next level of analysis is algorithmic representational level. So once we have the problem, we want to have a kind of a software idea of what, how this problem could be approached. So I would call it maybe a generic approach. And then at the lowest level, um, we have the implementation, so hardware. So how this algorithm is implemented, realized in the existing substrate, right? So these three levels of analysis are very important to think of when we conceptualize the notion of computation as the carrier of intelligence in, in, in the brain systems. And of course, this computational approach uh, gives us a lot of to to certain temptations. And one of the key temptations here is to reverse engineering, to take a, a re reverse engineering approach. So basically trying to build theories, bring, uh, trying to build uh, models, uh, systems that um, we will try to match on the performance level, on the behavior level with what we observe in humans. And then we're trying to reverse engineer how this specific function is obtained. So that kind of approach is very common. Um, and I would say that um, a lot of people who uh, build, let's say, who I would consider pioneers on this path, um, they, they took this approach uh, with very clear inspirations from cognitive science, from psychology, from neuroscience. And we can here mention Minsky uh, as one of these really forefathers of this computation-based approach to, to, to the brain. But of course, there were a lot of followers. We have Rosenblatt, we have a Grossberg, Fukushima, uh, who came up with a more symbolic, sub-symbolic neural computations. Then we also have uh, Donald Hebb, who, who built the theory of cell assemblies, which is particularly prominent in, in, the, uh, in our work here in, in our lab. Uh, the notion of associative learning. Of course, Turing, you shouldn't forget about Turing. Though Turing's intuition about the brain was uh, not quite right. So his general idea that the brain is important, I think, I would absolutely agree with, but his notion um, that he introduced of the de uh, developmental artificial intelligence, um, also interesting, uh, have, though, though have, ha having caveats, uh, which, which I think today we realize they're not really that obvious. So, so for example, one of those caveats that um, Turing introduced was the notion that uh, human, the, the ch child's brain is almost like a tabula rasa that uh, we put a lot of schema on, learning schema as we go on through our lives. Obviously, we know already that there's a lot of pre-existing structure in the brain when the human, uh, when, when the child is born. Uh, but the intuition that it's actually maybe interesting idea to develop um, advanced intelligent systems in, on, on the developmental path, pretty much following the idea of developmental neuroscience uh, is interesting. It's, I think, intriguing. Uh, and of course, we shouldn't forget others. Uh, we had, uh, you know, this notion of parallel distributed, pro distributed processing, uh, 
um, in in the context of neural network implementations introduced early days by McClelland, Rummelhart, Fukushima, and so on and so on. The list goes on. Interesting fact is that most of these this gentlemen here, are not only gentlemen, but also there were a few ladies there, uh, they actually published work in uh, cognitive science, psychology journals, not necessarily in, uh, in, com in computer science journals. So that's also sort of, I think, prominent sign of their inspirations uh, for the computation-based approach to the brain. Oops, excuse me. Jumped too far. Right, so if we look back, if we look back in where we are really with this uh, reverse engineering approach, I think, you know, there've been some success stories there, uh, but generally I think it, it falls into three major categories of approaches. So uh, first of all, I think one which is which uh, a lot of people in deep learning are, are most familiar with is pattern recognition uh, approach. So this is where we consider the brain as the big massive pattern recognition uh, machine. All it does is to receive information and transform this information to uh, some labels uh, or, or make some categorization of the sensor, sensor input it receives. Um, there's a lot of things to say here. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that because it's not necessarily the purpose of, of this talk. Uh, the other approach, which I would definitely see as very prominent in, in this family uh, of reverse, in, reverse engineering attempts, is a, uh, considering the brain as a prediction engine. So this is a lot of uh, probabilistic models, Bayesian models coming to this umbrella of prediction machines. The idea here is that, uh, or a premise here is that the brain, all the brain does is to make predictions. So the brain has certain model of the world, and then based on the sensor input, it updates its um, model of the world based on this input and the pre-existing uh, model. Um, and all it does, I mean, this, the, the purpose of this computation is really to uh, make very good predictions about the future. And of course, once, once the predictions uh, are, are failed, let's say we make predictions, the reality be, uh, turns out to be different. This is a strong signal for the brain to um, update the model. So this kind of a very classical Bayesian, I would say, approach, uh, which also has led quite, um, quite far, demonstrating a very, um, I would say, nice parallels with um, multiple different aspects of human, co uh, human cognition and behavior importantly here. So how the cognition manifests itself in various uh, experimental tasks. And then on the other hand, on the other hand we have a symbolic manipulation engine as the parallel for the brain. And this is where we kind of go away a lot from this notion of uh, the hardware of, of how the actual algorithms are run in the brain, uh, where we try to think about the knowledge in a more symbolic fashion. Uh, so these are early days where logic, reasoning, uh, the early days of artificial intelligence uh, were really uh, uh, were really celebrated. Uh, some, to some extent, of course, programming languages come from this area of, of uh, symbolic uh, symbolic notion of the brain. I would say, to some extent, also reflects the, the brain's capability to to use language. So it's obviously a very important uh, aspect of the brain functionality and the, the, the sort of engineering approach to it. We know, however, that intelligence is much more than, than pattern recognition, than prediction, and then operating on symbols. Uh, it's a lot about actually building models of the world. So it's explaining, understanding the world, uh, the understanding the world. it's planning, reasoning. In the, in the end, it's also about solving problems. Uh, of course, the underlying theme that the brain allows the brain to do that is learning and capability to create new models. So new information arrives, we need to have capability to actually extract what is relevant, update, inf update our models based on what, is, what we find salient. Therefore, you know, in some way, exploit learning capability to, to create new models. Right, so when we go and follow these routes, we can actually identify very clearly, I mentioned before some success stories and I was trying to sell this notion of the brain as either symbolic manipulation engine, pattern recognition engine, prediction engine, and so on and so on. Uh, but we should also, also acknowledge a very tangible uh, success stories. And, and I think one of the key uh, stories when it comes to pattern recognition approach is the, what we call today convolution neural networks. We sometimes forget how deeply the original inspiration was embedded in, in, in uh, neuroscience. So here you can see the two gentlemen, Hubel and Wiesel in the, low, in the bottom left corner. Uh, these gentlemen actually recorded um, uh, individual cells uh, 
from different parts of the path, visual pathways of cats, uh, simultaneously with, with um, stimulating retina of these cats by demonstrating some objects. This way, they were trying to figure out what, ne what neurons in different uh, parts of the pathway of the um, uh, cat's visual uh, system, what they actually do, if I just can use this very simple term. In other words, how they represent information. And they found uh, a plethora of zoo of different behaviors of cells uh, uh, with a certain hierarchical um, notion of complexity. So in early uh, sensory pathways, they found cells that encoded very simple features. And as they climbed up, um, they found a little bit more complex behavior of cells, which was hypothesized to aggregate information from the lower uh, parts of the, of the visual stream. Uh, so, of course, this has been carried through. Uh, today's, uh, today's network, they don't remind us very much of the earlier days, uh, earlier days thinking of, for example, Cognitron uh, proposed by um, Japanese, by, by Fukushima, as far as I remember, mm, uh, and so on. So, so this kind of knowledge has really progressed far beyond what the original neuroscience experiments has been. Another success story I think too important to mention here is the whole notion of reinforcement learning, very prominent today. Uh, and we don't always remember that this also originated in uh, psychology, in the whole notion of reward-based learning. Uh, and in, in not, such a long, uh, not such a long past future, uh, long past, um, we also found some interesting neuroscientific studies, experimental studies, where properties of neurons in subcortical structures of the brain have been associated with what we call reward, uh, which very, a reward and reward prediction signals uh, akin to um, some of the uh, mechanistic parallels in reinforcement learning as we see today in the context of, of machine learning. Uh, so on the, right, on the left hand side, you see um, interesting recordings people collected from uh, cats, monkeys, among others, specifically monkeys actually. Uh, performing some tasks, um, action selection tasks, and they could track uh, the decisions uh, to a very specific uh, notion of the rewards and how the how, how actually the, the the whole decision system is updated without going into detail by the notion of reward. Uh, and this, as I said, like, has inspired a lot of interesting work uh, in what we call today also deep reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning models. Uh, more recently, I think I would like to maybe draw your attention to this work by Yamis and Di Carlo. Uh, who introduced this uh, concept of goal-driven hierarchical um, convolutional neural networks that combines the what we see in neuroscience, the association, very strong association between the subcortical regions and cortical regions to perform tasks and goal-directed behavior. Uh, where are we today with brain science input to AI? So despite this, this, this um, interesting success stories, uh, we face a lot of trouble. Uh, and you know, we might think that it's very intuitive to think about uh, brain science uh, as the inspiration for AI, but we encounter some problems. So for example, some of the holy uh, great, great problems in AI actually haven't been that deeply, or I would say profoundly studied in neuroscience yet. Don't get me wrong, they, have, they, they are studied, but there is actually little theory and the, uh, very few working hypotheses for the problems of binding, for example. So this is related to, to uh, feature binding, relation between features, this idea of brain's cap capacity to, collect, to connect different uh, modality or different features of the scene it observes, not only visual scenes, and create, make sense of objects, of entities out of this. So the notion of gestalt perception, um, this is sort of a, um, a problem, long-standing problem if in cognitive psychology, in cognitive neuroscience, um, because we still don't fully uh, understand the, the mechanism underlying this uh, important cognitive capab capability. And of course, this is related more on a, a deeper level to the whole idea of structural compos compositional representations, how we represent the information in the brain. Uh, and we can carry on to other cognitive phenomena like variable binding, uh, role filler pairing. Uh, one of the examples you can see from our recent uh, work where uh, you can see the, the parrot um, which is on the, other hand, on the one hand, and the name of the parrot Charlie is on the one hand associated with a specific uh, context um, of this parrot. And on the other hand, it could be associated with the more generic aspects of, of the name Charlie, which, which can be referred to, to any other uh, person, uh, animal, and so on. So what we do basically here is we some, somehow uh, fill the role uh, of a Charlie by a parrot because of the specific 
uh, episodic associations that we have at the moment link to that uh, semantic label. Uh, so binding problem is not the only one, which uh, obviously poses a lot of ch challenge. Another important problem for AI is credit assignment problem. Uh, so in broader terms, it's, it's really uh, answers the question what we should learn from our experience. So as we go through experiences, we should figure out what is important and salient for us to learn to get out of this. Uh, in more detail, of course, if we go to the um, uh, deep learning, for example, one of the key questions there would be, uh, like which synaptic connections we need to modify and change. And we, we actually ask the same, ask similar question, not the same question in neuroscience. So what pathways, uh, what neuronal structures should be updated by which experiences and in what contexts? So this problem is largely unresolved. It's subject to uh, deep studies. It's something also where we look at quite, quite intensively in our lab. Uh, and it's obviously related to this um, computational notion of, of uh, generalization, transfer of knowledge. And of course, uh, in the longer term context, in the longer term, we need to think about the temporal uh, aspect. So, so the notion of the temporal credit assignment comes uh, quite intuitively uh, on the agenda here. So how basically from the sequence of tasks we perform or sequence of actions we perform, figure out which, which uh, parts of our sequence of tasks was particularly successful to lead us to successful solution of the uh, or, or tasks, task solving or, or addressing the task. So uh, in other words, how we can learn from a sequence of actions that we take uh, about um, the task we're gonna solve and, and how we should attribute um, the quality or the, 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 how we should distribute the credit uh, for solving the task, for reaching the goal to, to each individual part of the sequence of this uh, uh, action chain. So from now, how do we continue this effort? So one way to go forward, obviously, would be to still look at the brain function as the inspiration and try to come up with multiple different computational, computational algorithms that match this brain function on the phenomenological level without really caring how we do that. Um, one of the candidates, of course, is deep learning. And there's been a lot of recent progress in, for example, uh, modeling attention. Um, some of you might be familiar with this work where LSTMs are used with, with extra buffers to help uh, focus or to help gate the, the um, most salient information for processing. Pretty much like attention does in, in human. Well, I, 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 of course I simplify here. Uh, another sort of direction or sorry, another um, uh, concept that goes under this direction or umbrella of directions is uh, capability uh, of, of uh, performing some sort of a planning and imagination. And we see progress in deep generative models where, where they can generate some plans, where they can uh, fall into what we call sleep or we can, they can hallucinate, they can uh, make plans as well from, from the, the piece of, uh, pieces of knowledge they con they, they've been learned on, and they've been trained on. Uh, more and more we see uh, this multi-scale approach to memory also in, in deep learning systems. Uh, without going into much detail, there have been recent work uh, trying to make a parallel to the, this, the hierarchical memory systems we observe in the human brain as well. But of course, this work is still uh, in early days. The major problem I think though, is that there's no, that, that this line of uh, developments, uh, taking inspiration from the brain, but not necessarily trying to mimic the uh, underlying hardware, is that there, we don't arrive at any universal principles for how information and knowledge is represented. And we still have, we don't have a system level approach to cognition. So we build this bits and pieces here and there using different approaches, uh, phenomenologically trying to map the function, but there's no holistic overall system, system level perspective on this. Uh, how we can they get there? Uh, of course, one approach that I would advocate is to look again into the brain and not only to go into this computational theory algorithmic level uh, in the three level analysis that uh, David Mars proposed, but also trying to reach into the hardware level. So see what is the neural core, what, what the neural correlates are. What is the neural hardware that we need infrastructure that we need to fulfill this function? And uh, naturally we turn our heads to experimental neuroscience where it provides a lot of uh, experimental data in, in uh, more and more clever, I would say, or elegant experiments where, where, where uh, cognitive neuroscientists trying to come up with uh, elegant experiment linking behavior to neural correlates. Uh, some problem with this approach obviously is that uh, 
there's there's still hardly any computational theories. So they're usually based on like conceptual understanding how the brain could work, but that conceptual understanding is hardly put into some systematic uh, computational working hypothesis. So it's at the same time, I mean, this, this at the same time makes those hypotheses very hard to verify and validate in a meticulous fashion. And often the other approach, or, or um, often um, these approaches come along with this notion that if we just study uh, neural substrate uh, from the bottom up level, trying to record from you know, neurons, uh, networks, uh, this way we can somehow come up with how the intelligence arises in the systems. And, and I think that's a bit of a del delusion about uh, in that kind of line of thinking, uh, because it's hard to expect that from these first principles, we're gonna build um, human intelligence. So, so a lot of people nowadays advocate actually a, a more joint approach where bottom up um, neuroscience or bottom-up neuroscience, neuroscientific experimental approach is parallel or complemented with more top-down um, efforts. And these efforts go you know, all the way from the behaviorists, psychologists, um, cognitive neuroscientists to uh, computational scientists like ourselves. So the, comp the, the complementary approach that I would like to advocate here is where we're trying to parallel, or not parallel, sorry, but rather uh, we're trying to utilize uh, our computational way of thinking, this engineering uh, gorse that we put on, um, when we analyze and when we study the experimental data. So in other words, what we need to complement our experimental colleagues with, or experimental neuroscience with, is the more theoretical approaches and computational modeling approaches. What do they give us? Well, they give us the mechanistic framework. Uh, they give us uh, this theoretical framework uh, that allows us for integrating a lot of different pieces of evidence that we collect from experimental, experimental perspective, you know, ranging from uh, like scales of individual neurons to networks to, to systems to behavior and so on. So it helps us integrate all these pieces of evidence into theories and build systems uh, which um, also prove, uh, offer us a proof of concept that this can be actually implemented in, um, in, in the infrastructure which reminds us of the uh, neural substrate. And this is very much philosophy of, of, of my lab, of our lab here at KTH. The idea here is to actually try to, on the one hand, understand the brain function, but on the other hand, also following the Mars pre, uh, third level of analysis, also find the, uh, I would say, plausible neural implementation of this function in the brain. Uh, so the, the, our approach is kind of are two pronged. On the one hand, we're trying to build network models, uh, neural network models of the brain, using all the no, or not maybe necessarily all, always all, but using key principles of information processing as we know them from the neuroscientists, from the experimental neuroscientists. So, so obviously, we need to use these biological constraints in order to be able to follow this um, implementation level uh, that David Mars proposes. And we can do it at a range of different scales. It doesn't mean that we have to um, very faithfully and slavishly, I will almost say, uh, follow every piece of uh, neuroscientific finding. Absolutely not. Uh, we need to be able to distill what we consider uh, most relevant aspects of this implementation level to build what we phenomenologically refer to as cognition intelligence and so on. So that's kind of a like, computational modeling approach. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, that you can see on the right-hand side, you can see here um, a more brain-like computing approach where we um, really focus on uh, operational aspects of this theory. So we no longer care maybe so much about the biological hypothesis, but we much more focus on how much we can use this knowledge and use those models to actually build what we call intelligent systems. And of course, we still stick to the, some of the key biological principles because we would believe that they only, not only, but they guarantee to some extent uh, or offer hope, I should rather say, offer promise of implementing intelligence, um, but we see it very much in the focus of operational focus of intelligent systems. And here we more, I would say, generically refer to this computational aspect of cognition as, um, as uh, terms that we use like holistic pattern, uh, pattern processing, associative memory, sequence learning capabilities, uh, unsupervised learning of hidden representations and so on and so on. So this is more tangible in the context of machine learning and AI concept we're trying to bring from the neuroscience uh, field. And of course, what is critical for us are the synergistic effects between the 
um, this more computational brain biological uh, approach where we focus on on the uh, implementation function and understanding the underlying uh, neural mechanisms to this more operational perspective of intelligent systems that utilizes some of the key principles of uh, function and, and neural information as we see it from the algorithmic perspective so if we think about this uh, just very briefly i'm gonna now uh, give you some some examples uh, that, that gives you the glimpse of how we think about the you know, modeling of the brain. So one of the key concepts, one of the key aspects of the cognition is obviously memory. So we spend a lot of time uh, modeling memory. Um, my, my sort of individual interest has for often for, for long been in what we call working memory, uh, where we focus on this operational capability of the brain of, of working memory to store and perform uh, transformations on existing information on shortened time scales to be able to um, sort of convey, not convey, but conduct goal-directed behavior. So it involves planning, flexible manipul manipulation of information, but also this short-term storage. Uh, so how do we approach this? We approach this again from uh, you know, this, this computational perspective, from the um, computational theory of mind. We have some kind of hypothetical, hypothetical analysis, uh, sorry, we have some hypothesis about the underlying function. Uh, an implementation. So we use this notion of associative memories introduced by early days by Donald Hebb and then implemented mathematically by uh, Hopfield. And we're trying to uh, translate them into the neuroscience or the neural uh, substrate. Uh, so we, we use here some of the combination of this top-down approach, as you can see, because we have some hypothesis about the function and the bottom up where we're trying to fill in the biological detail to implement this function with what we know from our uh, experimental colleagues. And this way, we can actually arrive at a fairly complex microcircuitry that implements this higher order cognitive function. I should also say that, you know, I mentioned this uh, detailed uh, microcircuitry. Of course, it doesn't mean that we always have to go to this deep level of biological detail. As I mentioned before, sometimes depending on hypothesis that we test, we can simplify some of this detail uh, as long as we fully understand that that uh, reductionist still has some underlying um, possible implementation that the brain would tolerate. Uh, and what we do with these networks is we're trying to attribute them a very specific function here. Since we talk about working memory, we place this distributed large networks in what we call prefrontal part of the brain where we believe the executive function and working memory function resides. Uh, and then what we also can also do is we can, using these models, we can make predictions. Uh, so we can make some interesting manipulations in our networks, we can make some manipulations in our paradigms and trying to predict what the potential outcomes would be. And then we turn to our colleagues, experimentalists, uh, and we ask them to test our hypothesis. Uh, and this sort of generates uh, the whole loop of interaction between what we call computational um, approaches to neuroscience and, uh, and experimental neuroscience. But that's not maybe the main topic here. Uh, of course, a very important aspect of these networks and, and, and the memory in particular is uh, acquisition of information. So it's how we actually uh, not only represent information, but also how we acquire information, how we represent, how we learn information. Uh, and here we, we, we stick to what we consider the most uh, biologically plausible solution to be, which is the notion of associative learning proposed by Donald Hebb. That's why we often refer to it as a Hebbian learning, where the uh, connection between the neurons is only established based on the history of their coactivity or their collaboration. And the general idea is that if the, if the units, neurons, uh, networks, if they seem to coactivate, collaborate, then the connection between them should be strengthened. Whereas where they, if their activity is anti uh, uncorrelated, then obviously, they're not, uh, obviously they do different things. So um, there may be not so much interest in strengthening the connection and, and conforming uh, and making the sort of them conform. It's, it's then less interesting for us. Uh, we put this in uh, computational terms. We actually have, you can see here uh, in early days in 89, uh, Anders Lanzner, uh, Orian Ekebari, who used to work in, in the lab. Uh, well, used to, uh, Orian used to. If Anders is luckily still with us, very active. Uh, but they laid foundations really for what we call today Bayesian confidence propagating neural network. And that's the notion of this learning rule that follows this concept of uh, Hebbian, follows the concept of Hebbian learning. Uh, this allows us to not only on a phenomenological level 
uh, reproduce biological findings, but I think in, importantly, it gives us some handle, some interpretation on the concept of learning as such, which is, I think, very important and speaks also for towards this idea of explainable AI in a very broad term, of course. Uh, we can implement this, and again, this is part of our philosophy here, as we said before, we can implement this in, in very detailed models um, of the cortex. We can also implement it in, in less detailed models in a more abstract fashion, uh, as long as we understand that this reductionism, again, uh, has plausible implementation in the brain substrate. That's why we, we very often do make this sort of analysis and work towards uh, proof of co proving uh, the, the conceptual implementation uh, that conforms to the plaus biological plausibility. Uh, so uh, I mentioned short, short work, short term uh, working memory, uh, work, so working memory models, work operating on short time scales. There are of course long time scales, very important for the brain and interaction between the short and long time scales. That actually um, is, I would say, the cornerstone of, of what we call working memory as such in the broader terms. Um, and we perform some analysis, some studies in, in that direction. Uh, quite recently, with our brilliant postdoc, we we put a, a multi-network system together, made some interesting predictions um, about interaction of the long-term storage and the executive function in, in the form of the working memory. Uh, and this is very much laying kind of foundations for this more system level perspective of memory as well, and the cognition, because distributed system is exactly what the biology uh, tells us or suggests us as a solution to many problems that we, observe, that, that, that we can solve uh, towards what we call human intelligence. Uh, and again, this, for example, uh, provides, our, provides us with a hypothesis how potentially this variable binding problem I mentioned before could be solved. So it's one of those sort of uh, potential solutions to long lasting question. Uh, and more recently, we work with long term memories where we focus on this interaction between uh, various different storages of long term memories. Uh, but also um, this notion of episodic memories, which have contextual uh, information uh, related to the temporal spatial aspects um, of the experiences that we have, um, and also the semantic knowledge. So, so the knowledge uh, about the facts um, about the world, which also is important for us to operationalize our knowledge. So these different memory systems, of course, come together to uh, mimic and help uh, phenomenologically understand at least intelligence. Uh, so from this work, uh, as we said before, from this uh, quite extensive work on, on mesoscope, on network level, system level, um, brain, brain, model, brain memory models, uh, we're trying to actually take also a more uh, integrative approach uh, and we're trying to see how, how much of this uh, uh, modeling approach can help us predict and then build, um, I should rather say build infrastructure for intelligent systems. And here we can see this important synergy uh, moving from the, this, this network of network systems to, to a more um, operational, algorithmic, um, AI notion, uh, perspective of intelligence, which is reflected in capability to, to perform decision-making function, goal-directed behavior, um, with the use of reward-based learning, unsupervised learning, um, and all written in this uh, important cycle of perception action. It helps us instrument, instrumentally describe the interaction of the intelligence system with the surrounding world. Uh, so what we're trying to do, as we said, we're trying to map this more neuroscientific computational studies that we have where we ask biological questions to more of this intelligent system perspective, where we, um, with the use, some use of the reductionism, uh, trying to uh, demonstrate the capability of, of reaching um, machine intelligence through the root of brain implementation. Uh, so just to show you like the, the, the long-term perspective we have is to really to build this cognitive architecture where, uh, you know, very much in this notion, in the spirit of this uh, perception action cycle that I mentioned, where we receive information, we process in some sensory representations, um, then the information is, of course, processed in, in distributed memory systems, uh, um, then it's used for performing the, this, our you know, tasks on different timescales, whether it's a short or long time timescales, they need to be planned, they have to be assembled into plans uh, by our executive uh, function associated with the, uh, working memory, for example, attention. Um, and this, of course, wouldn't be able to happen if we didn't have this more overarching architecture, which allows us to 
learn on different time scales, uh, which allows us to to modulate the information that it's 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 provided from the um, uh, long term storages to short term storages, very much through the uh, subcortical gating systems um, uh, that also offer us this notion of capability of reward based learning. Uh, which in deep learning or in, in the machine learning or an AI field, uh, we attribute very much to the, the reinforcement learning field. Uh, so overall, this is sort of the idea of how approaching from the purely brain perspective, we can think of cognitive architectures, which not only phenomenologically demonstrate uh, the intelligence, but also have some aspects of the functional or, or I would say algorithmic implementation which uh, is relevant to biology. And again, I'm not here trying to argue that this is the only way to build intelligence, but I'm trying just to argue that this is one of the most promising ways since the, the brain offers us a tan tangible proof of feasibility of implementing uh, this beautiful, um, beautiful uh, functionality that we all experience every day. So let me just finish here. Uh, I can just show the acknowledgement slide. Uh, so we have, of course, the group of very talented uh, PhD students here with brilliant postdoc, Florian Fiebig. Uh, of course, um, the, the prominent central part of our lab is, is Professor Anders Lansner. Uh, we have uh, multiple collaborators, my long-lasting collaborator, uh, Dr. Michael Lundqvist, who used to be in the lab. Uh, now he's moved, um, visiting various, cogn various cognitive neuroscience labs, and then going back to the more computational field. And of course, we have other collaborators here, also in Stockholm, psychologists, cognitive neuroscientists, Karolinska at, at Stockholm University, and so on and so on. So there's a kind of a, a, a overall effort spanning from the experimental to, to cognitive and computational uh, efforts to, to wrap up notion of the brain intelligence. Let me finish here. Thank you very much for your attention.